music i think because it's really like i mean you wrote again really beautiful melodies and compositions but initially i wanted to ask you how did you get this beast of a project together actually it's a good question i mean i didn't i i just started writing music and and as i was through the process of writing i realized that i was hearing it for lots of instruments hmm. so um I mean, some of it started as a kind of quintet, a jazz mm -hmm. quintet. I, I knew very early on that I wanted Seb Rochford to play drums and Tom Herbert because we we had done a lot with Polar Bear and I love the way they play together. So yeah. I knew that I wanted that as the basis of it. And as I got more involved with the writing, I was hearing strings and hearing brass and woodwind, you know, so... Um, and I just kind of let my imagination go with it, really. I didn't really think about the logistics or how I was going to do it. You know, I mean, maybe if I did, I, I would have stopped then and there. Yeah, I know. <laughs> but I just, I just thought, well, let's do it. You know, let's try because I didn't have a commission or anything. I just started oh, writing. Wow. Okay. Okay. Um, and then I was super lucky because I do quite a lot of teaching in London at the Conservatoire, so I was able to take some of the ideas into the students and workshop oh, them yeah. with the students so they played some of the early versions of those of those pieces oh that's more because um, i'd never written for strings before so that was a big learning curve you know so you did all the arrangements yourself like for... yeah, yeah yeah oh wow yeah. that's a lot of work yeah okay so i was listening to a lot of music while i was doing it and getting my arranging book out you know things like that <clears throat> learning as i went along with it really yeah so um did you do it on like a Sibelius it, or something like that or? Yeah, Sibelius. Yeah, 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 okay, yeah, that makes it easier, yeah. Sibelius and piano, I mean, I, you know, I play a bit of piano for composing, mm -hmm. so. Um, <clears throat> yeah, and the melodies, a lot of those melodies came out of improvising, really. Hmm. I mean, that's kind of the core to my composing is improvised ideas, you know. Like on saxophone or piano or? Uh, both, really. Oh, okay. Wow, okay. So I record things that I find that I like on the sax and, and the piano, and oh. sometimes those those are the initial ideas of the piece, you know. Yeah, like Brave World, let's say, which has a beautiful melody on this one, right? So that was that came, like, from improvising, or...? Yeah, it did, it did. Oh, I mean, wow. that's... A, that that first bit of Brave World is quite... is actually an older melody. It appears first on an album um, about 10 years, no, more than that, 15 years ago that I did called Moving Air. Oh, yeah, okay, sure. Yeah. Which is a, a multi-track thing. I think on that it's called Brave New World, but that melody is from there, that little... Ah, that's how you snip it, yeah. Yeah, so it's a, it's an older 16-bar melody, but the rest is new. Um, and, yeah, that, I think that came through me sitting down. I mean, I have very basic piano skills, but I'm... I think I'm quite okay. I'm kind of better at counterpoint. So as long mm -hmm. as the counterpoint for me works, I don't worry too much about the chords. I can fill those in, you know, and work out what they are. Yeah. But if if I've got a if I've got a top and a bottom that I like, I'm I'm away, you know, and I get kind of excited and think, oh, yeah. yeah, I'm getting something. <laughs> yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think we're all yeah. the same in the, in this when composing. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And I love it when I find something that sounds fresh to me. You know, if it's if it sounds generic, I kind of give up, you know, I'm like, mm. oh, even though, of course, with hindsight, everything sounds like something else, you know, so. Yeah. How, how do you but make if that? I th how, how do you make it? I mean, it's, it's, uh, not now, like, but many times I encountered that when I wrote the composition, I was like, yeah, oh, shit, it's kind of I did that 12 years ago. It's again another groove thing, and it has like a okay. 
I mean, it's nice, but you know, how do we try to avoid repetition in composition? That's a good question. I don't know how I've managed to try and I don't know how I try and do that. I mean, I think I, I think I just leave it if it if it feels that I'm retreading the same ground. I, I can't. It, it probably ends up in my folder of yeah. you know possible ideas. You know, I have a folder of things that aren't quite right. Yeah. You know, or they or I don't know what I'm going to do with them. I tend to go for the kind of things that sound a bit more unique and then develop them. Yeah. Those, you know, so, um, yeah, it's funny, but I get a bit irritated if it's like, Oh no, I'm not the same thing, but, but I mean, of course you, then you look with hindsight and you realize that there's a whole load of things that you do as a composer. But that's you, you then, know? right? I mean, in that a way, becomes yeah. your kind of voice. Yeah. 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 Sure. So it's that's all good. Like monkeys then. Yeah, monk, but yeah, kind of I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, monk had play, he uses a lot of the same language, doesn't he? So yeah, exactly. It's, so yeah, it's, it's, when I think about it, yeah, 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 makes sense. But what about the grooves that you do, like uh, like believers, for instance? I, I love that kind of nine four, three four groove that you developed. Yeah. How did that one happen, for instance? Like again, just like messing around or? Yeah, I think I heard that. I mean, it's all, it's all the baseline really, bomb, yeah, yeah. bomb, bomb, bomb. So, and I think it was a challenge just, just like, okay, can I build a piece on this static groove? You know, can I, can I do that kind of thing? So it was a bit of a challenge and, um, I, I didn't really know how the drums were going to, um, approach it. So I didn't write a drum part. I just, yeah, sure. I gave Seb the, the bass groove, you know, and he came up with that thing you know um yeah. but yeah that was that turned out all right that piece you know i spent a lot of time on that and I, I realized that the interest with that piece has to come from all the contrapuntal lines you know because harmonically it's just yeah, it's, yeah. staying in one place you know so and that was a very different style for me to write like that you know normally i have more chords in it but yeah. it, it felt good so i carried on you know <laughs> yeah, uh, it's beautiful. I mean, but, but oh, speaking of the, the challenges, like uh, you guys didn't record it everything together with the orchestra. We did. We did it all live. How was that like? I mean, I, I mean, I've I've done years ago a project with strings. It was uh, like a small chamber orchestra, and you mm. know, I, I write music which is also like really rhythmical, like elevens, and all that I'm changing and. For them, it was quite hard to be exact because it's strings like, ka, 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 da, 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 da. like how was it like for you during the process with strings? Um, it was it was great. It was fine because uh, the people I booked were amazing. You know, they were. I mean, when I did it at the music college, it, mm -hmm. they found it super hard. The students rhythmically. I mean, yeah. as you would, as we all would. Yeah. Um, so I thought, okay, if I'm going to record it, I'm going to book people who can play like that. So the the person who fixed the strings, they booked people who can kind of play anything, really. I mean, yeah. they're, they're like London, top London players, you know, and they, so they might go and play a John Williams score and then they might sit in and play some Stravinsky, you know, so they, they were kind of okay with it, but, um, and we were lucky we had a really good studio which we so we had some separation for the yeah. bass and the drums and that was important you know um, yeah and we had a conductor conducting it yeah, as well that sounded, yeah. so that helps so that yeah. that really helps yeah 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 um, that's beautiful yeah yeah no i've followed you like i mean I, i'm starting this like just with these albums that you did because you know you've been quite active and uh, i also checked out the other the dual album new day with Hugh oh, with Hugh, yeah, yeah. I, I love, I love that record. Um, yeah, yeah, I, and it's like you know, it's so beautiful. How, how you guys kind of interact through the years, and uh, I know you, you guys did it already, like in Perfect House Plans. But like, mm. when did you guys meet? Uh, where does your oh, story begin? We met. We met so many years ago. Um, we met probably when I was first came to London. So it probably would have been 1982 or something. Oh, wow, already. Wow. Yeah. And Hugh was studying composition, I think, at 
Goldsmiths College in London and we met and we played together. We did, I think it was at a wine bar or something. We were, we had a gig, you know, just playing tunes and we connected immediately. You know, the kind of thing that we had was, yeah. was just easy to play with him, you know. Um, and then, as you mentioned, we had Perfect yeah. House Plants and we both wrote for that. Um, and we haven't done much recently. So when, when Hugh asked me to, to do that album, it was such a joy to do it. Um, I mean, the only thing about it was, is that we, it was, we, we went to Italy to this vineyard to record it and it was incredibly cold. The, oh, shit. We were down in the basement next to the wine barrels and they wouldn't turn the heat up because they've got all this expensive wine. So we, we had to do that concert in the freezing cold and oh, wow. it was so difficult for me. Um, tuning wise and yeah. and when we came off stage we were both convinced that we didn't have anything it was going to be not very good and i couldn't listen to it for about two months and then wow. i sat down and heard it and i thought okay well it's it's <laughs> not as i expected but there's an atmosphere about it that's really good that's really traumatic you know so we both like it now so yeah uh, how is it like for you to play in duo with, with just a piano player I mean, with him, you, you kind of have a really special chemistry going on, but mm. like, just saxophone and piano, that's a special thing, I think. Yeah, I love, I love duo. I love duo. And with you, he plays, he's so strong rhythmically and, you know, he's got all this Brazilian influence in his playing and he's got classical influences. And so it's, it's just that this kind of bed of yeah. sound that's amazing. And yeah. rhythmically, there's no question where it is with him he knows you know it's so it's it's easy playing with you actually mm. very okay. easy yeah. yeah it's because you know it, with drums i know you did that record years ago with uh, martin france uh, with yeah things that the boy can do or something like that was called like uh, oh yeah um hundreds hundred... of things a, bo a boy can make yeah exactly that's right Hughes Hughes album yeah yeah um, awesome. We've done so many things together, uh, and Martin Francis on a lot of those records. You know? Yeah, I love Martin. Yeah. And and of course he was in House Plants as well. So you know, yeah, Martin's amazing. Yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah. I wanted to ask you, Mark. Like uh, you, you mentioned, moving to London in early '80s, and I, I just wanted to go a little bit back, uh, like. Uh, you know, growing up, let's say in the early '70s, like being a teenager. And the British scene, you know, how, how was it jazz wise? What were the influences you heard the first jazz musicians kind of did you check out the Americans that came to the country or like who were the first jazz cats you actually like discovering? Um, it was a mixture of American and English because my, my dad was is into jazz. So he he's got a lot of jazz records. Hmm. So all the American stuff I'd hear from my dad, you know, he'd play Dave Brubeck and Ellington and Basie. And I mean, even when I was about, you know, seven or eight, I can remember waking up and hearing Ellington cool. on, on, on his record play, you know, in the, on a Sunday morning. Um, so I heard a lot of records through my dad. And then I had this friend, uh, John Ecott, who was in Loose Tubes with me, a trumpeter, and he he was really into British jazz, so I used to go over to his house and we listened to radio, the radio jazz in Britain. Oh yeah, um, Charles Fox, you know, um, Peter Clayton, and so we heard all these bands like John Stevens and you know um, Don Weller, um, Tony Coe. Mm. So I'd hear all those people on the radio. I didn't really have their records until a bit later on, but I'd hear them on the radio. So. BBC radio was super important for me. You know, yeah. it, I kind of heard loads of amazing music. And I heard John Sermon, that, who I really loved, you know, immediately I just thought, oh, yeah, John Sermon is incredible, you know, because um, he's got a completely unique sound, you know, and, yeah. and yeah. thing. So, yeah, so it was those two things. And my, my dad, um, I mean, we lived with my dad's, job we lived in america for a year when i was 10. Oh, really oh wow yeah in upstate new york we were i was so lucky and and my dad would he joined this record club so every 
week, I think he had an LP coming through the rack, the post. Oh, wow. Okay. So I heard all these incredible things, you know, Wes Montgomery record, you know, in 1970, 1971, you know, when they came out, my dad was sent these records. So I, I heard these things, you know, so I was super lucky to be so exposed to jazz, you know, in such yeah. a pr profound way. Yeah. It's great. Yeah. And when did you start like digging into it? Like who were the, the saxophone players that kind of moved you? Like, um, I used to love, uh, well, I still do. I love Paul. I love Paul Desmond's playing with Brubeck. Mm. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. Um, and I heard Getz, Stan Getz. I, I love all the Ellington people. Paul Gonzalez, oh, yeah. Harry Carney, um, and I, my dad took me to see Duke Ellington just before he died. We saw him in in Eastbourne on the coast. So you know, I mean, wow. I was very lucky. Um, yeah, and um, I loved. I think what drew me to these saxophone players was that they they were all different. You know, they weren't mm. generic. Sometimes a lot of things feel quite generic now, but. Yeah, uh, yeah. With those players, they were all unique, you know, and I love that, you know, I love the fact that they were unique, you know. Yeah. Um, and then I heard people like Wayne Shorter and, you know, Sonny Stitton. I mean, Phil Woods, I loved, you know, when I first heard Phil Woods, I just thought, oh, it's just because I played alto first before I got into tenor. Mm -hmm. um, and Phil Woods, I used to play along to this Phil Woods record like hundreds of times. You oh, know? wow. I just play along with you know with the record yeah um i never wrote anything down i just i just played along and tried to copy it but not very well probably no, <laughs> still, yeah, yeah. it was a bit too hard some of these things that phil Woods was playing yeah very fast also yeah, yeah very fast bebop lines yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. and so. what, what made you then i mean it was like a natural progress to move to London, right? I mean, jazz wise. Yeah, well, I, I went to college, so I studied classical sax and clarinet. Ah, classical. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, because oh. there was no, in those days, there was just one jazz course and that was in Leeds. And I didn't really want to go to Leeds because I knew that all the music was happening in London. So uh, it mm. was basically doing a classical course. So um and it was a bit weird you know p playing classical repertoire it's quite limited for saxophone yeah yeah exactly. i mean and sound wise and all the and sound wise yeah. is so different um but it was good for me you know and i my clarinet i play clarinet and um and it was very good technically for me to play that classical repertoire because it's really hard yeah. so you have to tongue and you have to articulate properly to play it so it was a good good thing yeah know, looking, definitely. Back, looking back on it you know and the, the, while studying like do you remember like how was it in let's say mid 80s i mean i know you joined you, you all guys kind of formed loose tubes together and uh mm. this was for your generation as far as i understand really an important project and group right and uh yeah. but before that how was it or even during that time to make yourself known on the scene how did that work in london i mean like playing wise and yeah yeah i mean london was amazing at that time because there was a lot of music you know there was a lot of there was a lot of south african musicians living in london because of apartheid oh yeah you know so there was all that influence there was re loads of reggae bands and things you know so we'd all go and do gigs with reggae bands and things. Oh like yeah. How oh, cool. That's cool. Kind of get stoned and play the reggae bands. Sure. You know? <laughs> um, but with, I was, I was, um, quite lucky because when I was at college, I met Django Bates and I met Steve Berry and John Paracelli, you know, I, I met them mm. before loose tubes. So I was kind of playing with those guys before loose tubes. Um, and then when loose tubes got together, we were all in this thing, in this collective and it kind of launched all our careers because yeah. we do a gig, we go and, you know, we get, we get in the coach and we do a gig and then the next day there'd be a review in the times or the 
guardian or the observer, you know, and and that kept happening. You know, every time we, or often when we did a gig, we get a mention in the in these newspapers, so people kind of knew who we were. So we were super, you know, we were kind of lucky that we were getting this kind of foot up, you know, to yeah. for our careers. So uh, people knew me and and Julian and Ian, they knew us as the loose tubes saxophone players, you know. Yeah. Young young Turks, they used to say, who were. Yeah, but it's those like, young Turks. Amazing. Yeah, it's amazing, you three guys, like, because all three of you, Ian, Julian, uh, and you, you all sound so different also yeah. yeah you have this joint sound around you that's kind of also composition wise that you recognize oh wow okay and, you know uh, I love yeah i that. guess i guess so i guess so yeah we were all very different in that band and there was another guy called steve buckley who uh, isn't as well known but he's a wonderful wonderful saxophone player you know and writer and stuff oh. so we were lucky to all be in that same place you know how was it like to work in the loose tubes because you know when i mentioned when i, when I kind of checked the names or who was part of that group it's incredible individuals and composers now all of you guys became you know strong personalities musically how was it back then like still i think you were how was what to work like i mean with so such individual personalities it was very funny you know i mean it was a it was a brilliant laugh. It was like a big party, really. I mean, we were kind of young, you know, so we were, we got a bit silly at times and, um, but it was a brilliant social. Everyone, everyone liked each other, really. I mean, yes. there were problem. there were problems as the band went on, but basically everyone respected and liked each other. And, you know, you, we talked a lot and we had fun and, and, people I mean in the saxophones we all respected each other you know because we were all different so there wasn't really any you know ego really I mean there was yeah. a little bit of it but most of it wasn't it was just kind of mutual respect and um, it was a it was an amazing scene it was a little microcosm of how society yeah that's the could feeling. be for a while you know yeah. and then and then as it went on, because there was no band leader, really, it was a co collective, mm. there were problems, you know, with getting new people in and, you know, stuff like that, so, you know, the usual yeah. um, problems that collectives have, but it was a fantastic scene. Yeah. Brilliant scene. And yeah. Then you guys did like a reunion, right? Like 215 or 214. We did. Yeah. yeah but how was did. that like then? Like after you, all of you guys probably did like hundreds of records, you know, <laughs> how was that like reunion? It was great. It was just great fun and it was brilliant. Yeah, it was really good. And the music still sounded good, you know, I mean, yeah, the arriving, yeah, it, yeah, arriving and, um, you know, all those tunes. I mean, I, I was a bit worried that they wouldn't because loose tubes was such a part of the eighties, whether it would work, you know, a bit later on, but of course it did because the yeah. the music's the writing's so good the tunes are so good you know yeah, and it's and it's interesting because everyone kind of was playing the same you know everyone i mean everyone had developed their playing but you could tell that even when we were in our 20s we were we were kind of who we were you know musically you know yeah it's funny that you have this basis always yeah you it's there you just molded somehow i think you form quite early on as a musician yeah. a, as a as an improviser you get better but your concepts you know are formed quite early on yeah i noticed that yeah well by you know listening to many records of many musicians i'm like well it's there of course through the years you get better or he got better and yeah refining the ideas but like the 80 percent it's there like you know it's yeah funny. It's like if you listen to Wayne Shorter, yeah. you know, really early Wayne Shorter, it, it kind of sounds, you can tell it's Wayne Shorter from, you know, yeah. later on, the quartet with Brian Blade, you know, it's yeah, the same. Instance, yeah. Yeah. Um, but uh, I wanted to also to ask you about your chemistry with John Paricelli. Uh, I know you, you guys did like, you know, Moving Air and uh, so many other projects together. And for me, he's 
you know, one of the best guitar players ever, probably the most underrated mm. guitarist in modern jazz, especially, I mean, in the continent here or, you know, in the UK, it's different. But like, how, how does your story, you mentioned you met him already before the Loose Tubes. Mm. Yeah, we, we had a band, um, Steve Berry, the bass, the original bass player in Loose Tubes, had a band called Let's Eat. And it was called Let's Eat because we used to have long lunches. <laughs> And we, so that was me, uh, bass, drums, and John on guitar. And so we were playing together in about 1982. But I met John because at college, the college that I was at, Trinity College, we, we had a big band, but there was no one who played jazz guitar. So someone said, oh, I know this guitar player. He's, at, he's studying at SOAS, I think. I think John was at SOAS doing not a music degree so we invited john to come and play and that's how i met john and oh. we just became very good friends and yeah and then we've done over the years we've done loads together um we did his album which yeah. you probably know um and then he's played on loads of my albums yeah um and we still we still play together i mean you know with this lockdown thing the one person that i've seen and played a lot with is john because he comes over here and we play duos and, oh really oh that's so yeah cool. oh man and i go up to his and we played sax and guitar duos and um but i keep saying to john you should do another album you know you should you should do another album because he's yeah. a great writer as well you know i know yeah yeah oh, you, yeah yeah he's such a player i mean i have him on so many records and i mean he's like on all the records of you guys from Louis Tubes, you know, on, you know, Julian's, yours, I think Ian's also, or with everyone yeah. he, he played, you know, it's, and it's so fun, always sounding like himself, but because you guys write different music, it's also different in a way. So yeah, so beautiful. yeah, he's he's amazing and he's fantastic in the in the studio, John. I mean, on Believers, uh, we we overdubbed that solo, I think. Um, because he wanted to put some rhythm guitar on it to for something to play with, you know. Yeah. So, oh, and I've got I've got a little video clip of him doing that solo, you know. And he's just it's great, you know. It's just um, he's done so much in the studio that he he just loves doing things like that, you know. Yeah. And we were when he was doing that solo, we were going, "Yeah, John," because <laughs> of cheering him on, you know. Yeah, that's so, beautiful. Uh, yeah. Yeah, but the, after the kind of, kind of, you know, loose tubes broke up, you immediately started Perfect Houseplants in a way, right? I mean, I, yeah. I, I, I kind of checked your development, and it's like, you know, you constantly have this constant going on, like from a project to project, which seems to be developing. Then Polar Bear later, but I wanted to ask you with Perfect Houseplants, how did I, I know? You know, you and Hugh probably kind of formed that group. But where did the idea come from and how were the beginnings like? Well, it's a funny story that because the, th the three of us, Hugh, m me and Dudley Phillips, who's Dudley, the bass yeah. player, we all had bands. So I had the Mark Lockhart quartet, Hugh had the Hugh Warren band and Dudley had a band and we were all in this, we were all in these three bands. <laughs> The, the only difference was that they each had different drummers. Oh, okay. So, um, I had a, uh, I had a drummer called Roy Dodds. Dudley had a drummer called Richard Bailey. Hugh had a drummer called Steve Arguelles. And so we had these three bands and we were starting to write music. So Hugh was writing a lot of music for his band. And I think we just, Hugh and I just said, look, why don't we just get a band? Yeah. Rather than have three bands, let's have one band. <laughs> so we sat around his flat and he, he had this book on his coffee table. And the book was called Perfect House Plants. <laughs> okay. So I think someone said, because we'd gone through these terrible names, you know, we'd kind of gone through this torturous process of trying to find a name. So there were names like Cloud Burst and kind of, <laughs> you know, I, I mean, the worst names. And I can't remember who, who it was, but someone said, 
how perfect houseplants, you know, this is book called perfect houseplants. So that's what we, we called it that. And, um, we liked it. I think the jazz press didn't really like it. They were like, we, we got one review once that said, Oh, it started off by saying oh, another, another band with a silly name. It said, you know, <laughs> oh, man. so it's like, you know, we were kind of fighting the jazz press a bit with our name, but, um, yeah, so that's how it happened. And, and Hugh and I wrote for it. Dudley wrote some mm -hmm. music for it as well. And yeah, we did a lot. We did about, we did three albums and then we did two albums with this early music group. Yeah. Exploring yeah. plane chart and stuff. Yeah. And it was a fascinating time, you know, um, we did quite a lot of concerts and things, you know. Did you ever go to the continent with, uh, I mean, like to Germany or Europe with, with those groups? Like. We Perfect didn't Perfect. much with House France. We we played at a couple of festivals, played in Portugal. Mm -hmm. I think we went to France a couple of times. We didn't really play much abroad. It was it was pretty much in the UK. Yeah. Um, the Orlando, with the Orlandos, we went to Italy a few times and played in Italy, mm. which was really nice. Yeah. Um, it's, it's funny though, like, so much of the UK jazz kind of stays within the uk i don't know why and it's so much it's bizarre right in a way i mean i've spoken with stan the saltzman the other day about that like how many groups and everything is there and it somehow rarely goes to the continent in a way which is or vice versa many times also i mean like very rarely we go to the uk to play which is interesting uh, yeah and it's probably going to get worse with Brexit. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you know. but no, I, I, I'm not sure why that is. I mean, I, I think some of it is everything is so underfunded, you know, I mean, yeah, sure. I mean, I, I know it is most places, but you know, I think places like Denmark and Scandinavia, it's, right. it, you know, the arts are better funded. I mean, for us, it's really expensive to go and do a tour in, in Germany. Yeah. The, you know, the time yeah. you get out there and you got to pay for accommodation and all that it's you know maybe yeah maybe that's why it doesn't happen too much yeah but uh, uh, and but then i wanted to also ask you about the polar bear story i mean you have played with sap i mean he's and tom herbert for a long time and uh i love that group that's because sap made such a nice mixture you know he's such an amazing drummer and but how, how did polar bear happen and uh, that story uh, that's a funny story because um i got this phone call from seb and i i'd never met seb and i'd never met tom i'd never met any of them because they're a bit younger than me they're younger and, yeah, yeah and they was they were starting out and i got this phone call from seb and he speaks very quietly very shy and he said um is that mark lockhart and i said yeah he said i'd like you to join my band <laughs> <laughs> and it was like, it was so funny because I was like, um, oh, brilliant. Have, have we met? And he said, no, we, ha we haven't met, but I saw you. I was at your gig last night at the 606 Club. I was playing standards and he said, um, he said it was a lovely gig. And I said, oh, that's nice. I said, I said, why didn't you come and say hello? I think I said something like that. And he said, oh, well, it wasn't the right time. You know, you were chatting to someone, you know, so. It was very sweet, you know, and I, and I didn't know who he was. So I said to him, and this sounds very big time, but I said to him, look, send me a tape, send me a, a CD of the music because I don't know what it is. So a couple of days later, this CD arrived and it was Polar Bear with another sax player without Leafcutter John because he joined later. Mm -hmm. And it sounded beautiful, this music, you know, it was Tom, Seb, Pete. Pete and another sax player who I can't remember his name and I think the other sax player was leaving the band for some mm -hmm. reason so that's why Seb wanted me to to do it so as soon as I heard the music I thought oh yeah I'd love to play this music you know so so that's how I joined the band and our, our first the first gig I did with them was in Cambridge at one of those balls Cambridge University balls you know where yeah they have in the summer and everyone goes mad and they drink champagne and 
it's like the great Gatsby, you know, it's yeah. kind of, <laughs> and that was the first concert that I, I did with Polar Bear and it was lovely. Yeah. And, and then we were together for, you know, 13 years, you know, so. it's, it's funny that like this natural progress from perfect houseplants, you kind of, the ball immediately rolled into Polar Bear for you, like almost. I know. Weeks. It's it was like beautiful. it was like his second career, you know, because a lot of people my generation were like scratching their heads, thinking, "Oh, what do I do?" And I was I was lucky; I had this opportunity to play with this kind of cool band, you know. Yeah. yeah. How was um, the work progress in that in Polar Bear? I, I, because Sep, Sep kind of is the leader, right? Or wrote all the music, more or less? Or Seb wrote all the music. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it was an, it was an amazing band. He. He had such a overview of what the how he wanted the music, you know. So, I mean, as you know, a lot of it was very improvised. Yeah, yeah. Especially as the band went on, it, it was very open sometimes. But he kind of knew what he wanted all the time, you know. He's um, incredible, really. And I learned so much from Seb about everything, about you know, pacing. Yeah, such a taking thing. your time with the music, um, not being afraid of lingering on something for a long time, you know, all those things that I were, I was a little undeveloped. I learned from, from that band really. Yeah. Um, so it was amazing. And we did loads of concerts, you know. Yeah, sir. Um, I can believe that. Yeah. I mean, it was a shame we never really had a manager and, and that was one of the problems with it towards the end is it, it, it wasn't very well organized, you know, so, and people had families, so there were, sure. there were yeah. te tensions with that, but it was a shame when we finished because, you know. Yeah. But you did so, so much beautiful music. I mean, already that dim lit, the first one or the, uh, that I have, I mean, it's so beautiful. And then it's just, like you said, it's like, it gets so mo modern also, you kind of kept it going, you yeah. know, Fresh. And each, each, each album's a bit different, isn't yeah, it? It's, yeah. yeah. And uh, I wanted to ask you also that, like, speaking of all these groups that you played with, how, how, do you, how do you keep it fresh? Or how did you guys keep it fresh playing with kind of the same people, you know, for 10 years? It can be, in a way, it's really amazing. But on the other hand, it can become repetitive. So how do you make it or keep it fresh? I think it's about just being open to anything you know that happens within the music really and you know not to have too many preconceived ideas you know it's a bit like where we started about me saying i just with days on earth you know it was a, it was a process of mm. running with an idea running into it and not being afraid of well not being afraid about logistics and not being afraid um stylistically you know just and that excites me not to worry about the style of the music you know if people don't think it's jazz that doesn't bother me you know matter. Yeah, sure. you know it's like bill frizzell doesn't i he's very inspiring to me because yeah me too yeah yeah I, and you i'm sure you know and he yeah. he doesn't he doesn't care what whether it's a and from a musical or a, a, a child's song or you know a, nursery rhyme it's you know so um i think it's just being open and not being close to anything really mm -hmm. um, yeah and with polar bear that you know there were times where we didn't really know what was going to happen with the music you know and and it's but it just felt amazing so we would just go with it you know yeah um, yeah that's beautiful yeah. Yeah. yeah so you mentioned frizzell like for, for what i've learned from frizzell it's like you know, you shouldn't be afraid of just playing a G chord, you know, or whatever. <laughs> it doesn't have to be like this complex, I don't know, star 5, 11 or whatever slash chords things. It can be just like winks. Oh, okay. And yeah, uh, I love that also with him. Yeah. Since you mentioned him, I mean, it's so beautiful. Yeah. And he, he's probably heard Jerry Douglas play like that with Alison Krauss and just yeah. go, woo. Exactly. Yeah. I you know, this I did this talk like with him and he said like, with, you know, with Bill. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Did you? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Awesome. And it's, 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 ama it's amazing because he said like about Jerry Douglas and those Nashville guys, 
how different it was for him because they all come from a different improvisational thinking and so for him it was like yeah like you said now like whoa wait a second you know yeah i i think i think sometimes in jazz you know people look for kind of they look for the kind of complicated things you know in jazz and obviously it's great to see someone with a fantastic yeah yeah. technique but you know some of the simpler things are the are the really profound things you know yeah um, and and i think going back to one of the first things i heard i think i i think that's one thing that i kind of understood quite early on was that you didn't have to do pyrotechnics to be true to move people you know you could play like johnny hodges or you could you know sing like bob dylan or you know so i kind of realized that that you know quite i was quite early on you know yeah that you that that's really important you know yeah you, you also i mean mentioning of this individual voices and like not playing complicated it's one of the names that pop up also with you and i have i have this one is with kenny wheeler the mirrors and with norma and uh you know, Kenny is for me, top three jazz musicians, favorite players and composers. And I wanted to ask you, how was it like for you? And also, because you kind of, your generation seemed to play with each other a lot, but how was your connection with the older generation of musicians in the UK, like that came before you? And uh, how was it working with Kenny also? I mean, that's kind of two questions. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I. I haven't played that much with the older generation just because stylistically I think what I've been doing is a bit different. Mm. So when I was asked to do the Kenny thing, the mirrors, I, I was over the moon, you know, because I, I played in his big band, I depth in his big band, but I'd never recorded with him before. Uh, and it's the same with Norma Winston, really. I never really worked with her until the last eight or nine years yeah um so it was incredible working with kenny and i mean he was you know he was quite old at that time and a bit frail so i had to be you know i wanted to tread carefully and sensitively so i didn't want to steam in and yeah you know hog any limelight or you know so it was it was quite um it's quite a challenge in a way playing on that that record you know to do enough and but not to do too much and and there's things on it that i i don't like that i did you know mm. and some things that i do you know so i it's um but he was wonderful you know and he he was so welcoming to me and yeah. su supportive and um but you know i i i have such respect for that generation you know um you know, you mentioned Henry Lowther. I mean, yeah. Henry played on one of my early records that we we did through Rose Coloured Glasses because we mm -hmm. the trumpeter went went into labour. His wife went into labour while we were recording. Oh man! Wow. So he had to leave the studio. So someone said, "Call Henry. Henry lives up the road." So I called Henry Lowther, and he said, "Yeah, I'm just finishing my tea. I'll just finish my tea." And then I'll come down. That's so cool. <laughs> so he did. He finished his tea and he came down and he played on the rest of the record. Oh, wow. Um, so, no, I love those people. I love, you know, and, and we mentioned John Sermon and uh, Tony Coe is. Yeah. He's a mind blowing saxophone player, you know. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. To me, you know, so. Um, but I haven't worked with many of them really, you know. I've worked with Kenny, worked with Norma worked a bit with tony levin chris lawrence i play with occasionally did you ever you know. play with uh, john taylor a couple of times i did his big band yeah and mm. okay. played on a jazz course that we were teaching on mm. but never recorded with john taylor mm. i would have loved that oh yeah man you have such a connection with piano players so you probably would be a nice one yeah yeah i mean i was playing with you all the time you know yeah, so sure. Hugh and i were like Arr. yeah yeah sure. <laughs> <laughs> that's beautiful so there was no time but but no it was a it was a wonderful generation that you know um because they it sounds unique you know the whole ecm thing and all that yeah. 
yeah. all that kind of world that came out of those people. Yeah, that's so beautiful. It was, was, yeah, it was beautiful, yeah. I wanted also to ask you this. Uh, you know, when speaking about that older generation, like Henry and all these guys, they did also so much studio work. Like, as, as you know, in the 80s, uh, I don't know, I spoke, spoke to Henry and, he, he, you know, he did Elton John records or Stan Saltzman did, I don't know, Paul McCartney, Grace Jones, everyone's the studio work in the 80s. And I wanted to ask you, did you also catch like part of that last train, the studio work? Did you do a lot of studio work in like for pop rock contexts or in London? I did a, I did a bit. I never did masses. I, I, I did a bit. So I played with, you know, a few people and yeah, I would do, I would do a few things. Um, but I was never, I never did um, that much of it, you know. I mean, I've, I've done film things and uh, mm. things like that. I still do the occasional film score. Where someone phones me up and I go and play. And, yeah. Um, but yeah, no, I'm I, not to the same extent as those guys. I mean, Kenny was super busy as a studio musician. Yeah, you know? yeah. And Stan, you know, I mean, amazing, really. But you, you did like some, I read with Radiohead also something? Yeah, that was amazing, yeah. How did that happen? We, um, I just got phoned up by this trumpet player who, who knew Tom York and he said, um, Tom wants some horns on, on a song. So, so we went down to their studio in Oxfordshire uh, and we played on the national anthem on Kid yeah, A. Yeah. And it was amazing. It was amazing. And they, they wanted something that, um, I think Johnny Greenwood was into Mingus at the time. So he, he wanted something that was kind of, you know, yeah. kind of busy. And so they had a bass line, which the baritone does. And then we just improvised around it. Mm. Oh, okay. But it was incredible. We went to the Amer America. We just played on one song. Went went to New York with them. We went to France. With oh, really? Them. You actually played concerts then? With yeah, we did concerts with them. Just for that one song, or one song. Oh man! <laughs> oh, okay. That's we incredible. did about we did about four concerts. Yeah. Wow. And and they were filmed as well. I mean, we did Saturday Night Live. That was the big thing. We went to New York, really? did Saturday Night Live, and played the national anthem. <laughs> Wow. So we, okay. so we had this kind of holiday in New York, you know, all paid for. It was brilliant. Just played on one tune. Wow. Um, it was a bit frustrating playing on one tune, actually. It would have been nice to have done more, you know. Yeah, some arrangements. Yeah, it's funny to come on for eight minutes or something. Or... But they were they were fantastic to, to us. They were like, oh, we've never worked with any real musicians before. They were so humble. <laughs> That's funny. That's bizarre. Yeah. But the, the, can I just ask you uh, just one, one more last thing? Like uh, uh, you, you mentioned New York, and were you ever tempted by to go into New York or playing there or recording there? Like, I, I'd love to, but I don't. You know, I don't know many. I, I don't know. I mean, I think I think uh, historically, I've just enjoyed what's happening in the UK so much, and and I had so many close relationships with musicians oh, okay. here um that i'm you know i didn't particularly feel a, a massive desire to go and play with yeah american musicians i mean I, I, i'd love to but you know i want to play my music i guess with them and, and yeah, yeah sure may, maybe one day i will you know yeah no i just wanted to ask you that because you know many guys do that but your generation not really actually you know all these the julian did it a little bit Mm. You, know, you and Ian kind of do your own thing, and Django also. I mean, partly with some Americans, but okay. Yeah, so. I mean, I think I think because the European thing that we're involved in is is so different from the American yeah. thing in a way, conceptually. You know, conceptually, the aesthetic maybe is different, yeah. the aesthetics. Yes, yeah, so that's the word. Yeah. Is different. Um, I mean, you know, I. I most of my records, I have thousands of records, and and it's mostly American mu music, you know. Yeah. So, I love that's that's the tradition for me, you know. But, it, in a way, it's too precious for me to kind of yeah go go down that route too much, you know. I I don't want to try and 
sound like John Coltrane or <laughs> yeah, yeah, because yeah. they're like, oh, you know, I want to. I don't sure. see any point, you know. I don't, sure. In a way, you know what I mean. Thank so, you, Mark. Thanks, thanks uh, for sharing uh, some of the thoughts. So that was great fun. I enjoyed that. Yeah, it's, thank you so much. I, I love love hearing uh, all these different stories. So, uh, so thank uh, you. Great. Yeah. Well, keep keep up the interviews. It's great. I looked at I looked at a couple of them. They look they're, they're lovely. You know. Yeah. Doctor so. Jazz. Thank <laughs> you.